you. I want to thank uh, Bob also and his, Mike, his son Mike. Uh, every week they record and put up the sermons uh, on YouTube, uh, which, is, which is amazing. Mike doesn't even go here, but he puts time and effort into <coughs> that. Uh, which, which allows like me to watch, you know, Paul last week do an amazing job. So thanks again to Paul. Um, but for those of, there are people who watch just on YouTube, uh, like my parents. So, hi, mom and dad. <laughs> when, you, when you watch it, or, or my wife too, you know, uh, and Rod when he's not here. So it's, it's great. It's a, it's a good tool that we have for people who can't make it or um, if something really resonates uh, to be able to have access to it. So thank you guys for that. Well, we're, we're in a series uh, going through the, the Gospel of Mark. And the goal is for us to really encounter Jesus more this year. To, to learn who he is, maybe at a deeper level, to, to see from, from the gospel of Mark, what Mark wants us to know about Jesus, how he impact, Im, impacts our lives, that he has authority over all these different things like scripture and sickness and disease, even spiritual beings, um, even you know, the, the, the forgiveness of sin, right? All these things showing that he is truly divine, not just not just a teacher. And so as we are walking through Mark, we want to, we want to encounter, encounter these things too. To get to know Jesus a little bit more. Am I on now? Is that better? Oh, oh no. well, it helps if I turn my mic on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we want to encounter Jesus. Uh, and we want to, once we, once we know him and we say, we agree with Mark that Jesus is Lord and Savior, what, what does that then mean for my life? How can I take comfort and rest knowing that he, you know, he's, he's everything and he has authority over all these things that really scare us, whether it's, it's our physical illnesses, whether it's evil beings, whether it's the storms that Paul talked about last week, you know, like literal storms or, or just difficulties in our lives. Like we, we need to lean into Jesus and know that he is over all those things. He's got authority over all those things. Uh, and that should give us a lot of peace and a lot of rest. Today's passage is, is particularly interesting for me as I was studying this week and um, focusing on this, this section of, of Mark, which is Mark 5, 21 through 24, uh, uh, for, through 42, if you want to turn there. Uh, because it's about time. It's about time. And how Jesus is, has authority even over, over time. Uh, how many of you are, are time people? Like, time matters to you. Like, you want to be on time or early. On time is, like, kind of late. Um, do, do you wake up and set alarms on your phone for, like... <laughs> You're my people. Okay, you're my people. Uh, like every morning I get up, I look at my calendar, and I say, okay, I need to set an alarm for these things, but I have to set, it, set an alarm for when I'm supposed to leave to go, right? So everything is, is scheduled, right? It's going to be, you know, so in my mind, even like the driving to anywhere, even insignificant places, is like, I just want to get there, right? Like the, the journey, the drive is... It's just annoying, right? I want to get to where I'm Then when I'm there, I'm like, okay, now we got to make sure we're on time to, to leave. <laughs> How many, can anybody resonate with, with this? It's a little crazy. Uh, that's okay. You know, God forgives me. And, you know, my wife's helping me with these things, uh, which is good. Uh, but some people aren't time people. They're just like, oh, we're just, you know, we'll just go with the flow. Uh, and they're late for everything, you know. And, and that's okay, too. That's my wife and her family. And I love them dearly. But... <laughs> You know, her and I are we're working each other, working on each other with that, which is which is great. Um, but one thing that we're going to learn today is that Jesus doesn't want us to stress over time. Uh, he doesn't want us to, to to be anxious over getting somewhere because a lot of times that that getting somewhere and the timing and all these things are just things that you know like. It's important to us for some, some reason to, to, to be somewhere at a certain time or to make all these plans. Um, but we can't control most of, of the day. We can't control most of life. The timing, as much as we think we're in control of it, at the end of the day, there's, there's very little we are. 
Uh, like for instance, I know how to, that I'm gonna, in my mind, how to drive home from here today. And I go down power, the 60, I turn right, it's pretty easy. Um, but, but I can't tell you for sure how that's gonna work. Uh, there was like a month and a half that there was, it was closed going uh, west, uh, but every day I would still drive down thinking that it wasn't every week when I left, it was still closed. So I had to go a different route. Uh, and I was like, oh man, this is taking longer than expected. But, but sometimes God intervenes in our lives or puts us on a different route, or causes us to slow down uh, for, for a reason. And, and a lot of times that reason is to teach us that, that we're not in charge of time. And if we can just rest in the, in, the, in the fact that he really is in charge of time, then we can breathe. And, and we can put things on him that we worry and stress out about, and know that he really can control it better than we can. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, time, time. So it's the, the perfect timing. There's no such thing, humanly speaking, as perfect timing, even though there's times that, that literally I sit in the car to go somewhere and my alarm goes off. Like as I sit down, I'm like, oh, look at that, it's beautiful. Like exactly, that's exactly what I wanted to, to leave. Uh, at those moments, I'm like, oh, that's so, I'm so good at the, you know, getting ready and going. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's God is the one with perfect timing. And we've, gotta, we've just got to own that. And if we do, we can really experience peace and encounter Jesus at a, at a different level. So our first section here is the faith of, of Jairus the ruler. And this is 521 through 24. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open there. It says this. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Uh, so, so what we see here, again, as we're walking through Mark, and if you've noticed, we're not hitting every verse in Mark. We're... we're Hitting some main sections, we're still take, we're going to hit most of it as we go through. Um, we see that Jesus' fame is growing. His popularity is growing. Crowds are getting bigger and thicker. You can imagine like seeing a celebrity out in public and people are gathering. And it's, it's almost impressing upon him. I think Paul even last week talked about how you know, he had to stand like on a little boat or something because there was just too thick of people. So as he's even... Walking around, people are just starting to push in on him and, and gather around him even, even more. His popularity is growing. It, but as Mark is moving us quickly through the majority of Jesus' ministry, times like this, when he's zooming us really into a specific event and telling us very detailed things, it's really important. We've got to say, what, what, why, why this? It isn't just because he knew it. It's because there's details about it that he wants us to know. What is it about Jesus here that's, that's, that's different that he wants to teach, teach us as audience? So out of this crowd comes Jairus. So you can imagine him maybe pushing his way through, right, trying to move people aside. He's got a, there's an emergency that he has. Uh, his, his little girl, which we know is 12, um, is dying. Uh, and and is close, we know she's close to death because we'll read a little bit later that she actually dies um, very soon. So you can imagine the panic, the stress, the anxiety. He's not just going somewhere insignificant like I am yeah, maybe on a, on, a, on a day stressed out about getting somewhere on time that doesn't really matter in the long time. He, he has a, a mission to, to push through the crowd, to get to Jesus, and to get Jesus back to his house to hopefully heal his daughter. And so, if we see that Jairus is a, a ruler of the synagogue, uh, which means he'd likely be well known uh, in the community. Um, he, was, he kind of is in this kind of middle, middle ground area. So he's not a, a religious leader, so he's not like a scribe or Pharisee, he's not in that group, he's just, he's a laity. But he's also the director of the, of the synagogue, right? So it'd be like Heather, Heather right here. 
Yeah, so he's like Heather for the synagogue. So he's, he's uh, planning the activities. He's well connected to the, the religious leaders because he's, you know, they're, they're his friends. He's got to schedule their time and things that they do. But he's also a, a, a pillar in the community. He's a, he's a well-known figure. He's a man of means. We see he has servants that come uh, and talk to him um, soon too. So he's in this middle section of being connected to the religious leaders and also a part of the people. And what we've seen so far in Mark is that the people are, are attracted to Jesus and they're coming to him and they're experiencing him and learning and trying to encounter Jesus. And there's an acceptance of, of trying to understand who Jesus is. And then also the religious leaders are rejecting Jesus and plotting to, plotting to destroy him, as we saw a few weeks ago. And so you can imagine Jairus' position is a little, is a little unique. Uh, you know, and so as he's trying to figure out for himself who Jesus is, he's got to not you know, tick off the people that are the religious rulers, the leaders. You know, so he's got to play a little political game here. Uh, and so you kind of imagine what that could be like for him. But there's something about Jesus that that Jairus knows could, could maybe heal his daughter. So even though he's been in this position of kind of like a middle ground area, um, this is a moment in time that he's at his, at his last effort. It's like, like, what can I do as a father whose daughter is about to die to, to hopefully save her? And so you, you, you push aside this, this idea of like, what will people think how am I going to get through the crowd? What will my religious leader friends think about this? Because what I need is, is to get to Jesus. What I need to get to, Je is to, get to Jesus. And when he, when he gets there, it says he falls on his face and he implores him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So you see him fall on his face, act of worship, imploring that's very emphatic here he's begging jesus i need your help but this is his last effort and no matter who's watching or who's in the crowd or or whatever religious leaders could be thinking about him in this moment he doesn't care because all he cares about is, is how can i save my my daughter um, who's about to die this is the this is the reaction to jesus that that mark wants us to see Right? This is the reaction to Jesus that we should, we should have. That when we need something desperately in our lives, when we need anything in our lives, even just every day, we should be coming to Jesus, acknowledging him as Lord, as King, and asking him for, for help. No matter, no matter what that means personally or within our families or positionally, Right? We shouldn't care about that. It's Jesus who is ultimately our, our Lord and Master, who's, who saved us and is, is giving us new life. And, and he's the only one that can do it. So this Jairus is teaching us a, a valuable lesson here. This is the way we come to Jesus when we at our, uh, don't have anything else to go to. When we think we're in control, like this guy is a, a well-known figure in the community. He's done well. He has a good job. Right? He's well-connected. But he can't save his daughter's life. He can't, you know, and, and, and that's heart-wrenching. And so all he has left is to come to Jesus and to, and to ask him to help him. Because he, he knows that he can do it. He knows that he can do it. And so Jesus goes with him. Jesus goes with him. But it says the crowd is even pressing upon it. I think the text says thronging, which I've never used that word but it's like they're, they're really pushing in more, you know? So it's like a sea of people. And I can imagine Jairus, right? If I was him, like being in such panic in a hurry, you know, I'm, in a, I'm that way just to get to dinner, right? But like he's trying to save his daughter's life. So he's, he's like, can you imagine him pushing against the crowd, maybe holding Jesus's hand, like dra almost dragging him to get to where they need to go. Uh, and just like this crowd is just like the text wants us to, have this picture in our mind about how how many people are there and how frantic he would be to just try to get through them because he's, and he's trying to get Jesus to where they're going. And I can really resonate with that as somebody who is like time sensitive, let's call it, 
right? Uh, and so hopefully you can see what this in your, in your mind. But then but in the middle of this, something happens. Uh, there's, there's a distraction. This is verses 25 through 34. And this is where we see the faith of the woman, the faith of the woman. And it says this. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better uh, but grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd uh, and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So again, we've got kind of a story within a story here in Mark. It's really cool how this is all framed together and what's happening. So again, as, as it, you're picturing Jairus, like I'll probably, you know, try to pull Jesus and get the crowd away to get to his daughter because he's desperate to, to save her life. All of a sudden, this lady who has great faith, and we see this parallel between her faith and Jairus' faith, and, and she, but she even says, if I could just like touch his garment, like I'll be here. Like there's, there's something even more here with her. And, and, and she does, and Jesus stops. He stops, and he wants to, he wants to know who, who's done it and, 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 and have an interaction. And if I was Jairus, I'd be like, no, <laughs> like, what, what, like, we don't, we don't, we're not stopping. Like, we're going somewhere, right? We're, we're trying to get to a destination. And again, it's, it's a desperate situation. It's not just, you know, dinner or to be on time for a show or, or whatever. It's, it's something very important for him. But for Jesus, he, he stops. And he wants to find out who did it and, and have an interaction with this lady. And again, being time sensitive, I can just imagine Jairus freaking out. And who, who even is this lady? She has no name in the text. She spent all of her means and resources trying to get healed. <coughs> um, Mark you know, wants us to emphasize like how, how lowly she, she is in life. And because of her issue, she's probably an outcast. So you have this, this leader, who's important, uh, who, who's well-known, who's got a lot of means. Uh, it, and then you have this lady who has no names, who has nothing, um, but, but they, they're both desperate. They're both desperate. <coughs> if you notice that Jairus' daughter is 12, and she's been suffering for 12 years. So which means on the day his daughter was born, this lady's disease started. So there's this real element of connection here between these two, these two people that they wouldn't even know, but somehow right here in this interaction, their lives become intermingled. Um, it's, it, it's amazing how God can work in these miraculous ways and, and, and to show us now this, how, how he's working out this timeline uh, that took 12 years and a lot of desperation um, to, to reveal to us um, how we can encounter Jesus and when we do what that truly can, can, can look like and mean. So in this case, Jairus' daughter is dying and Jesus, when he talks to this lady, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So not only do you have these two 12-year examples, you have Jairus' daughter who's dying, his human daughter and then jesus saying to this lowly lady with no name who's insignificant you're my daughter you're my daughter which again speaks to us because for jesus it's not just about your child or your specific son or daughter but we're all his children and in your position in life or or wherever you are whatever you doesn't matter to jesus 
right? We're all his, his children. Uh, and he wants us to encounter him and come to him in faith and say, through you, I can be, I can be healed. I can experience something different. And I, and I need to trust you with timing in, in my life because I can't, I can't do it on my own. So we got this situation here. Again, he's, he stops, he talks to her, he heals her, and it's beautiful. Um, and the question is, have you ever experienced moments like that in your life uh, where you're in desperate need, maybe there is an emergency, maybe the red light just seems to last forever uh, to get somewhere, and you're like, hurry, or the car in front of you just won't go fast enough because you're trying to get somewhere. And, and what, what Jesus is saying to us here is, it's okay to slow down because your timing to get there is, is different than my timing. And guess what? When you get there is right when you were supposed to be there uh, because Jesus has a perspective that's much, much higher and better than ours. Uh, and sometimes when you are supposed to be there is, is right when you, when you are uh, and not something that we can control or, or do. Uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Jairus has to learn patience and trust here because Jesus stops <laughs> and he can't force him to go on until he's ready to, to keep moving. And that's really important. So even though these two people are in different positions in life, you see the same response from both of them. They, they fall on their faces. You know, they, they know that Jesus can help them. The next section then we move on is, is, is back to the story. This is the miracle. So again, we go from Jairus and him pushing through the crowd, desperately trying to get Jesus to his daughter because he knows he can heal him. And then we've got this break in the story where the lady comes in and, and, and he heals her and, and stops and, and has an interaction. And then we go back to the other story and we see how they're intertwined with all these different details, which is awesome. And then now that we get back to the story here, this is 35 through 41. So now it says, while he was still speaking, so he's still talking to this, this lady, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And we had entered, he said to them, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside, took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went and where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. So what we see here is, is again, during this interaction, right? He's talking to this lady. He's stopped. Jairus is probably frantic at this point. They're probably not even that far from this house, it seems, because the servants get there pretty quickly um, with the report that she's, she's dead. It's too late. They didn't make it. And at that point, if you were Jairus, your heart would have just dropped, right? Because you were trying to get there. You don't understand, like, why Jesus' urgency wasn't high. This is life and death. You're kind of an important figure. You know, this is your daughter. And then you get, you get stuck on this, you know, other person who we don't even know his name, what her name is. And then, you know, you, we find out she, she's died. And they say, why trouble the teacher any further? And here's an interesting little, like, this little comment that they make. Why trouble the teacher any further? See, for, for, this is a, for, for us as readers, you know, these details matter. And so the detail we get here is that the, the messengers coming back to, get, to let them know, what do they see Jesus as? A teacher, he's a rabbi. They haven't yet understood that he's also divine, <laughs> that he's God, that, that the situation they're, they're facing can still be solved because of who he is and what he has authority over. They, don't, they haven't gotten there yet. So they come and say, you know, this is why he was so desperate to get him there. 
to, to touch his, put his hands on her and to, to heal her. But we've always seen before that he can just say something and, and somebody be healed, even if they're not close to him in proximity because he's God, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be touching them. So there's still this view that you're, you're a teacher and you, you're, you can do miracles, but not quite there yet that you're, you're divine, you're, you're God. So let's not bother the trouble the teacher. But he says, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. That's the call to them that Jesus was saying to them. But again, for us as readers, this is what Mark wants us to hear these words. For those of us, especially that are, you know, very time sensitive or, or worried about the day or have the anxiety over family or, or things in life, he says, do not fear, only believe. Don't fear. How comforting is that if we really encounter Jesus, can fall on our faces and give him everything that is, that is bothering us, that's causing us anxiety, that's giving us stress, our children, our families, our friends, our work, our finances, whatever it is in our lives that is just overwhelming sometimes. And we think we have some level of control over them and to say, no, just, just don't fear and, and believe. Don't fear and believe. I, I, can, I still have this because I have authority over it. And if, if, if you really can encounter me and embrace this, life can be a little easier for you. <clears throat> life can be a little easier for you. So for Jesus, uh, you know, when he gets to her, he says, oh, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Because again, for God, it's it's like it's just she's taking a nap. It's 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 as easy as calming a storm. Remember what last week when they're in the boat and they're they're like, well, we're gonna die. These sailors have probably even experienced something similar before. They're they're freaking out, and, and Jesus is sleeping, right? He's like, this is nothing. Like, just calm down. Or a demon, when we see that earlier, a spiritual being, when he just says, what, I'm gonna muzzle you like a dog and send you away. Or like a leopard, he just says, you're healed, you're clean, right? Or he forgives sins. Like he's got authority over, over all of these, over all these things. He's got, he's got authority over life and death. And so for Jesus, her being dead is just like taking a nap. He's like, this is, this is okay. Like I can just pick her up and, and bring her back to life. <coughs> and guess what? She'll still die, right? She, who knows? We don't know how much longer she lives. The same as like Lazarus, right? Like they'll still live a life and 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 die eventually of something. But here, what we see is that for Jesus, he has authority over life and death. He's Because he's God. And that's what we need to encounter is, is a, a savior who is God, who can do so much more than we can, and who wants to take our anxieties from us and just believe and breathe and try to experience life a little, a little easier. It's also cool because we get one of few actual Aramaic sayings that Jesus says, because he was probably speaking in Aramaic, but we have Greek, uh, Koine Greek written for us. But here we read Talitha Kumi, which is probably what he actually spoke. And then we see that Mark says to the audience, this means a little girl I say to you arise, right? So he's translating it in Greek for people who don't know Aramaic. Uh, it, it, so then we get the reaction. This is, this is verse 42. It says, immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. All right, so, so again, you, again, going back just a, a, a few, a little bit here in the story, that this desperate father trying to get Jesus to his daughter, pushing through the crowd, you can just feel his anxiety, his desperation, his last effort to save her life. And then there's a distraction. And during this time, I, I know for me, I, like, I just feel this so much that I'm just like, you're, you're just almost dying for the guy. Like, oh my, like, like, keep going, like you're almost there. Uh, and then she, they, she ends up dying. She ends up dying. Jesus says, no, it's okay, let's keep going. And they go, and he, he raises her up, and she begins walking around. 
And again, they make this point that she's 12. We're supposed to make these connections with her and the other woman and the timing and the fact that we're all children of God and he's the one that has authority over time and life. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. This is, uh, this Mark is always wanting us to see how people are reacting, right? And we see a lot of, of words like they're, they're astonished, uh, sometimes they're afraid, they're amazed. This specific word um, is only used a couple times in Mark, and we'll see the second time way later in the story. Um, but this one means um, astonishment, bewilderment. Um, it's the word we get ecstatic from. Um, they're, they just don't know what to, what to do. Like he literally raised this little girl from the dead. And the question for us is, you know, are we, are we being constantly filled with that level of, of amazement uh, around Jesus? And what he, what he does in this life for us, or are we trying to grab on to the things that we can control so hard, even timing to get to a destination that we forget that he is ultimately over it all? Or are we allowing him to, to reveal to us these opportunities that he's just putting out there so that we can constantly be amazed by what he's doing in the world and what he can do through our lives? So you have both these women, both having one sick for 12 years, one 12 years old, both desperate, both at the end of their lives. You've got Jesus healing them, both daughters, not only of Jairus, but of, of the king of the universe. It's a story of faith, hope, and of patience, <laughs> uh, and ultimately of new life. The little girl has a new life now to live, and the lady who's healed can experience life differently because she was... She was out of resources and an outcast because of her condition. And that's what Jesus wants for us too, to experience a new life, to have faith, to have a level of hope and trust in him, to just believe um, and, and to go with him a little further. So what do we do with this? To encounter Jesus, the first question is, are you bringing Jesus everything you need? You see these two examples here, uh, one of Jairus coming to Jesus, desperate, who cares about what people think, who cares about the crowd, who cares about what it will mean for his career, <clears throat> or his, whatever he's doing in life, falling at his feet, begging Jesus to help him. Because he knows that this is his last effort. What do you have in your life that you need to, to bring to Jesus? To fall on your face and say, Jesus, I need your help here. I'm desperate and I need to just give it to you because I can't do it myself. I can't. That's what Jesus wants for us. Write down in your notes something that you just want to give to Jesus and say, here it is. I can't do it. I'm desperate. And I, and I know if I can just touch your robe, you can, you can work a miracle. You can heal me. You can do anything. Can even raise the dead. What in your life do you need to give to Jesus? Number two, do you have faith like Jairus and these two women? Or this, this woman? Jesus says, have faith and believe. Right? The, the crowd and the, and, the, and, the, and the desperation of pushing through it to get somewhere when on your timing to think, okay, if I can just get there on my timing and and make it, it's gonna be okay. That's about me, right? And what, what I think I can do and, and all these things. And Jesus says, it's not about you. It's about, it's about me, it's about him, right? And if we make it about him, then all of a sudden we can, we can put that away and have, and have faith and belief. And so what we're learning these lessons here, that we need to have faith. We need to have faith that he can heal, that he has authority over the things that we don't and even over, over time itself. Number three, do you trust Jesus' timeline? Do you trust his timeline? <clears throat> Write down here, what, what do you need um, to submit to Jesus in your life? For some of us, it is maybe time. 
like I have a I have an issue with time. <laughs> like I, I know it's a problem, uh, and I need to. There's times I just need to relax and say, okay, uh, let's let's go. You know, um, I remember specifically not too long ago, Rebecca and I were traveling, and we we're sitting in the, you know, that long wait you have sitting in the, you know terminal waiting for the plane to come and, and, and to leave. I always want that time to be long because I want to get there early, right? Rebecca wants to get there like, like we, we get there, they start boarding. Like that's her <laughs> philosophy of, how many of you are those people? I don't, yeah, I don't like you. Uh, <laughs> but that's Rebecca, let's just like leave the last moment, get through security, it'll be fine, right? Get there, get on the plane. And I'm like, no, I'd rather just, you know, get there and chill. You know, know we're here. Right. And then even the plane, you watch it get later and later, and you're like, oh, but still, it's good, because we're here. Um, and she wasn't feeling good this one time. And, you know, still about 30 minutes or so before boarding, and she goes, can you go get me some soup? And there was like a restaurant down the tarmac a little bit, a good bit, that had, was like a, had Chinese soup. And I go, okay. So I run, like literally ran, because in my mind I'm like, okay, I gotta get there and back before they start the boarding, it's gonna be like tight. So I get her soup, come back, she eats it. Um, she, we're sitting there together. I'm like, I'm like, okay, good, we're, we're ready to go. It's like five minutes now until boarding and she turns to me and says, can you get me some more soup? <laughs> and for a second in my mind I go, in my mind I'm going, no! I can't, how can I possibly get you more soup? We're gonna, they're gonna start lining up and we're not even the A group, you know? We're like B something deep, you know? And, and so there's probably a lot of more time than in my mind, I think, but I want to be there when they, you know, it's part of the excitement of flying, you know, you want to be there. And so being the good husband I am, right, I say, okay. And so I, I run back to the restaurant and come back, and guess what? They're, the plane's running late, right? So I sit down, and she just looks at me, and she's like, see, nothing to worry about. And I'm like, okay. You know, I'm sweating, it was, it was fine. But, but again, like, like we, we, we think we're in charge of time, and then your wife can say, I need soup, <laughs> right? The, the, last, the last second. Uh, and, and we have to decide how we're gonna react. Time is, is a funny thing. But we have to trust Jesus' timeline over our own. And sometimes for this woman who was sick, it, it took 12 years to, to encounter Jesus and, and to really be healed from it. And for this daughter who only lived 12 years, we don't know what exactly was wrong with her, but it was something, maybe, maybe it was her whole life or something she encountered, but she's still little and young, right? And for her, for her dad, who's much older, like those 12, those, that time that she was sick would have felt like an eternity. We gotta give things over to Jesus. Your issue may not be time like, like mine is uh, or, or others. It might be something else that you have to say, you know, I just need to give this over to you. I can't control these things, but I know that you have authority over everything. So take a second, just write down there. What do you need to give back over to Jesus? And can you, can you live life on his timeline, not, not, not our own? And then finally, are you being amazed at Jesus? Are you being amazed at Jesus? See, if in these situations, when people are at their last, like we, we typically wait to our last effort here, right? Uh, to come to Jesus and say, I need you, I need you, help me. And it's really a lesson also about suffering because when we go through hard times, we, we get drawn to Jesus even more. I'm desperate, I need your help, I know you can do something, please show up. And then we, we want to see the, the miracle, and we want to just rest in his, his goodness and his love for us. But then when times are good, or things aren't as stressful or whatever, we tend to back off of that a little bit. And we don't, we're, not, we're not focused on Jesus as much, and what Jesus wants for us is to have a, a balance in this. Right? When things are stressful, come to him, fall on your face and say, I need you, I can't do this, but I know you can. And when things are good, we come to Jesus and we fall on our face and we say thank you for, for all the things that we have and that life is good. It's not, because it's not about me and what I've accomplished and done, it's about you and what you continue to do in my life. And we know life is about ups and downs and there'll be times that we fall on our faces because things are, are hard and we just can't bear it. And there's times that are good and we can just relax and say thank you for this, this day or this moment that's nice and, and I know that you've, you've given this to me. 
So we want to be people who are experiencing Jesus and encountering him all the time and, and looking for the opportunities to truly be amazed by him. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your timeline. Thank you for just the, the, the just even these little stories, these accounts, the, the details and how they speak to us today. That we want to come to you, fall on our faces, give you the things in our lives that are, that are challenging and deep. Um, but know that you're always there for us at all times when things are hard and when things are good. And we want to just rest in your presence to have faith and believe and trust in you. Help us to do that this week and today. As we're thinking about uh, this and your word, help us all to give more over you to experience human life, and to be amazed by you every single day. In Jesus' name.